Securities offered through Cetera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through CWM, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Cetera Advisor Networks, LLC, is under separate ownership from any other named entity. Carson Partners, a division of CWM, LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. This is The Way to Wealth. With host Scott Ford, a jiu-jitsu fighting, woodworking, beekeeping entrepreneur who is also the managing director, partner, and wealth advisor of Carson Wealth. Financial freedom is the goal, and clarity and simplicity is how we'll get there. Let's get to it. This is Way to Wealth. Hello, and welcome back to the Way to Wealth podcast, where we're all about making money simple so that you can fully live and fully live now instead of 40 years from now, since that's really all we have. Anyway... Excited today to have Dan King on the podcast. I met Dan from a, another podcast guest, and then Dan and I have spent um, several hours on the phone getting to know each other better, what we do, and we de- definitely have a lot of synergies, and Dan has a lot of experience and wisdom that I felt like would be useful to the audience, so I invited him on, and he accepted. So thank you for that, Dan, and welcome to the Way to Wealth podcast. My pleasure. Appreciate the invitation. And our time together is always so enjoyable. So I can't resist the opportunity to take a little bit more. Looking forward to it. We'll see where things flow and unfold as they always do. So I'll share a little bit. Uh, My audience likely doesn't know uh, of you, Dan. So tennis and meditation loving lawyer. That's unique for sure. Turn business growth strategist and executive coach with a gift for challenging but warm conversation. And I can attest to that, having had several conversations with Dan. He's helped leaders understand and realize their potential, successfully transition careers, and augment their sales capability. Also worked with a shark on Shark Tank. Has a lot of accolades, actually has a lot of experience and studied psychology at Columbia University and law at McGill University. So again, man, and it also a veteran of two extreme auto races, which is kind of cool because yeah, life's not all about business. So again, thanks for taking the time, man, for jumping on the Way to Wealth podcast. I would love if you're open to it, to Mm -hmm. you shared with me, audience doesn't know, just a little bit about who you are, what you're up to, what what gets us on this podcast today uh, with just a little bit of your backstory, Dan. Sure. So I'm originally from Canada. I live in Brooklyn, New York now. And my sort of life and professional journey have taken me in a few different directions. And I started life as a corporate attorney, worked at a large law firm, and then with one of the sharks on the Shark Tank show. And that brought me into contact with entrepreneurship. And this would have been about 10 years ago now. And I knew at the time I wanted to be an entrepreneur, not a lawyer. It just jumped out at me immediately man, I'm glad that I'm with these entrepreneurs because it's showing me how much more I feel like an entrepreneur than a lawyer. And so over the years, I built three different companies. The first failed, the second I grew and sold. And now I run my third company, which is called Fireside Strategic. And Fireside began, I think, from my experiences working as a corporate attorney, realizing that the human aspect of business wasn't respected too much in the profession. You know, when you're working a gazillion hours a day and yeah, you're relatively well paid, but your stress levels are really high, your mental health is endangered. It's not the most pleasant place to be. And I realized that, you know, there were some people that were up for sticking it out for seven to 10 years doing that. I believe life can be a 10 out of 10. And my life was far from a 10 out of 10 when I was doing that. So I took what in retrospect doesn't seem like that big a leap, but when you're in that arena does feel like a leap, left law, started entrepreneurship. You know, it's been a roller coaster journey, but in starting Fireside, I really wanted to do business with that human side of things respected. I cared about growing a business just like any law firm wants to grow, any business wants to grow, but I always want the people that work for me, the people that I work with and me to feel respected and to feel like we're doing work that we're aligned with. It's always been at the core of of who we are. And so Fireside is about two and a half years old. We started as a growth strategy consultancy where we would help companies you know, grow while ensuring that all the people on the team were aligned. You know, we would help companies find a growth strategy and we would make sure that the team was aligned with that growth strategy and everyone was excited to work on it. And now Fireside is becoming a private equity fund. You know, we've realized that we're most aligned with buying businesses and bringing this human aspect of business growth into a portfolio of companies. 
So we integrate strategy and humanity together, and we believe it's a better and different way to do business. And I'm so glad that even though I spent years as a suffering lawyer, now a recovering lawyer in a place that wasn't aligned for me, I had to go through that journey in order to see that there's a different way to build profitable businesses and there's a different way to do business. And it's a way that respects our humanity and who we want to become in the world. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I've shared the infinite entrepreneur, which is my methodology of the infinity symbol and the four pieces to that. And it's really just all about helping entrepreneurs and business owners well, candidly learn from mistakes I've made because I've been the opposite where I've been too hot. And it's just all about growth and I'm burning the candle at both ends. And then other areas of your life are out of whack and suffer. And then I've been on the other end where I've been hmm, more of a lifestyle practice and really focused on family and the, uh, and the other areas of life. And then you're not really growing to be able to add the additional value that's needed. And so finally, feel like landed at a place where it's in flow. And it's what I call the infinite entrepreneur where things can be in balance. And when I say in balance, nothing's ever in balance. It's recognizing what balance looks and feels like. And like nature, as we guide out, we recognize it and we can guide back in versus getting too hot and too cold. And the irony is you actually have a better business when run like that. And I really love the idea of the human aspect because for me, this is now all about helping a thousand business owners on this same path. They've typically been at it 10 to 25 plus years. Um, They've pretty well figured their core business out. That's dialed in. They may be preparing to exit or not, but the business is closer to self-managing. And now it's the what's next. Now it's the legacy and impact, which typically ties the human component clearly for the team and just from a bigger perspective of global impact, like what can we really do to leave legacy and impact? And so, Mm. yeah, that's what really resonates with wanting to have you on is because it sounds so synergistic with what you're doing when you're talking about strategic impact and human impact. 100%, 100%. I think the business world needs it all the more now that we've been through two plus years of pandemicking people can no longer hide from the fact they're misaligned. You're a business owner and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. If you're supposed to exit, if you're supposed to build a different future for yourself, you're not going to be able to hide from that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Where do you think people get it wrong, Dan? So I've said the example of you can run too hot or you can run too cold. What have Mm -hmm. you seen either personally or in working and consulting with business owners where Ah, they could just maybe do it better or they get a little out of balance. What's been your experience there? More commonly, it's the too hot. I agree with you that there's a total balance and you can go too cold. Like in the end, you want to, I call it the calendar test. I think what's most important is you look at your calendar each day, you wake up and you think, is this what I want? Do I actually want to go to these three meetings that are on the calendar? And it can be a real challenge to cull the things from your calendar that you don't want. But in the end, it's going to be better for everyone if you do. And so I I tend to see too hot more often. I think in the entrepreneurial world, while there is more and more discourse around take some time off, rest, self-care matters, I think on average, there's much more hustle porn. There's much more work until you die, right? And so more entrepreneurs than not run too hot. Now, Mm. what's interesting now that we've become a private equity fund and we're acquiring companies this is this conversation, Scott, I have with business owners potentially looking to exit all the time because many of them have been running so hot for so long, they're burned out and they've lost perspective on, is this the business I'm supposed to be running? And so part of what I see my role as, I don't just see my role as someone who goes and makes a bunch of money and acquires companies. I help business owners understand, let's get a little perspective here. Like, should you actually want to exit? Many of them come to me and they're like, I want you to buy my company. And I'll say, maybe. If I'm interested, I still don't want to do it. And in fact, I was with a business owner two hours ago and realizing, helping him understand his relationship to his business. Because when you're in it, it's really complicated. And having someone to talk it through to understand what do you really want in your life, really important. And as a private equity fund, when people are, I'm talking to people right on that cusp of considering an exit right? That's a pivotal life moment. You've got to have perspective to make a good decision. 
couldn't agree more. It seems to me the biggest missing element in our day and age is that having that space and margin and time to really reflect. It's one of the reasons I like the name of your company being Fireside, because it is that time and space by a campfire, no real agenda, talking things through, letting them percolate, getting to like what's really intuitively right for you of what you want. And it just seems like that's missing. And one of the biggest dangers for me, you can have a great financial exit and you can just set yourself up for wonderful multiples uh, on EBITDA or whatever, where you have a great payday. And to me, the bigger danger is if you don't still have a really big why and purpose as a business owner and entrepreneur, you're setting yourself up for potential real danger. I mean, I think the statistic on depression with business owners exiting without a proper why and clear vision beyond the exit is really high. A plan for beyond the exit. I have never heard anyone in sort of the PE or acquisition space use those words, but they're bang on. They matter so much. The legacy that you want to leave, right? Like it's so easy to be short-termist when that big paycheck seems to be right there. Like that's the moment in which it's hardest to have a long-term mindset. That's the moment in which it's easiest to lose sight of yourself. And so you have to have a very strong sense of self to sit in that moment calmly, mindfully, and make a good decision for you and all the stakeholders that are dependent on you. How do you suggest people do that, Dan? So certainly one would be hire a coach, hire a firm. It's why you set up what you do, because then they're going to hold you accountable, get time blocked on the calendar and work through it with you. So clearly that's one. What other mm-hmm. suggestions would you say? Because I know what ends up happening for a business owner ends up chasing their tail. They're like, oh my gosh, I just don't have enough time to keep up with the business, time to keep yeah. up with the family, time to keep up with all these responsibilities. Now I got to get time you know, and figure out how to have time to get clear on my why. Any suggestions or thoughts on that if someone's thinking that? Love the question. And I think the answer is different for different people. And the way that I would think about it is that now we have in mainstream society access to more and more tools for deep reflection than we had even 10 years ago. So, you know, today you can journal, you can meditate, you can sit with psychedelics. There's a whole range of interesting options, all of which have pros and cons, which you can get into if you want. You know, I I often think when it comes to psychedelics, which I feel comfortable talking about openly, I, I hope you do too. There are, you know, some people say that there's a price to unearned wisdom, right? Jung said that. He thought that, man, you can have one really powerful night, but there could be consequences to that night. And I think when we think about journaling, it's a little softer. It can be a long-term process like meditation, an unforced process. But there are moments in life when that big paycheck is coming, potentially, when a lot is riding on your decision that I think psychedelics can produce a big impact quickly. It can shift your world or can shift you and your relationship to your world and your perspective very quickly. Now, sometimes the world doesn't catch up so quickly, right? And you find yourself a bit of a fish out of water. And, but every modality of transformation has strengths and weaknesses. But those are a couple that I think people in a big moment, you know, like considering a business exit, journaling, meditation, psychedelics, those are three really, really powerful ones. And figuring out, I think, which one feels right to you, feeling into your intuition in the moment and deciding this feels right, go with your gut on that. Yeah, that's good stuff. And so interestingly enough, I just uh, interviewed a friend, Yannick Silver, uh, with Maverick 1000. And he mm-hmm. he made his, he wrote his, he, he, he published a journal, which is a really cool, I think it's called a cosmic journal. And so he is a daily journaler. I know you also said, priorities. And I think if you were to walk in nature as an example, or meditate or journal or do whatever feels right to you, my suggestion is look at your career. When you're thinking of priorities, and now you start listing some priorities and the why, then take those priorities and flip open your calendar or flip it open on your computer and look at your calendar. Because it's easy to lie to ourselves But what's on your calendar is your priorities, no matter what you're telling anyone or yourself. Couldn't couldn't agree more. We too often uh, set up an image of ourselves. We might even believe it and we might tell others that's our identity. 
but the calendar is one of the quickest barometers of the truth of what you're doing, because what you're doing is who you're being. That's it. It's the truth serum, that calendar, right? So it's, you're going to get to the bottom line by looking. One thing I would want to ask um, is I'm going to flip the finances because this is the way to wealth podcast. So of the infinite entrepreneur, this is the money piece. Yes. So I always like to ask guests, what's the earliest childhood memory that you have of money? So I will never forget uh, growing up with my dad who had a very different relationship to money than I do. So for most of my, I'm 36, for, for most of my earlier career, I've been pretty frugal. You know, I left a six-figure lifestyle and at the beginning I had no other source of income and I built businesses over the years. One failed, one succeeded that I exited from, but it's been an up and down financial journey. And knowing that, I've always approached entrepreneurship from a fairly frugal perspective. My father was very, very different. So he, um, he was a brain doctor, is a brain doctor, still with us, thankfully. He did very well, but he also lived even larger than his income. Mm. And so he spent a lot. And I grew up in a pretty small town in the East Coast of Canada. And it's not a town where you want to brandish your wealth. It's a town that has a pretty critical relationship with wealth. And my dad loved very fancy things. It's funny how I've, I've kind of run in the opposite direction. So I'm frugal. He's the guy who wants the big watch, the big car, and he wants to show it off. And I was socially sensitive at a young age, and I felt a certain amount of shame being seen with him when he showed off these big items. And so when I think about wealth, my earliest memory is as a very young child, not fully understanding what was going on at the time, but appreciating or feeling that he was being judged. And so I would ride with him in one of his big cars, and I would purposefully try to move my head below the window so no one could see me in there. I felt such a sense of shame around all of the judgment. Now, looking back at it, I can see this. Mm. And he approached his spending and his material possessions with so much pride. And I think it's such an interesting memory to think about subconsciously how our relationship with wealth is built from often a very young age. Thank you for sharing and being vulnerable with that. That is exactly why I asked the question, because it does, it leaves an imprint. And so for me, I have several, and I'm not sure this one before you just reminded me, I, I forgot about it. I can remember because mm. we didn't have money. And mm. uh, so on the opposite end, like really didn't, I have some pictures of me, I'm the youngest of five. And like, there will be times where we, I can remember mom saying, oh, I'm just not hungry. You know, and so making sure we had enough to eat, well, you have no idea that's what she's doing. You just think mom's not hungry. So as a silly, dumb kid, you just go ahead and eat. And so I can remember being dropped off sometimes uh, from school when I would be embarrassed and what, no, just drop me off up here because we had this clunker car. And even sometimes on the school bus, uh, not wanting to like drop right off at our house because it wasn't the nice house in the neighborhood, those kind of things. And so clearly that leaves an impression. And so maybe what, what attracted me to this and then why I'm so hard charging to figure it out. That's certainly part of it. So just recognizing that it's why I always like to ask that question. What would you say, Dan, knowing that um, again, money podcast and knowing what wealth really is. Wealth is truly a sense of well-being is true wealth. And if you just think of monetary and money as a means of exchange and think about that, what has been the best piece of advice that you've received or learned that if the listeners were to take one thing from this podcast and one thing only as it relates to money, what would that be? It isn't worth as valuable as money is, as essential as it is, it isn't worth giving up what you truly want in life. I believe that if you do what you want, and if you can watch your calendar, if you can watch yourself, if you can do the self-awareness modalities that we've been talking about, you'll understand deep down what you really want. Most of the things that we pursue in life are not our true wants. So there's a really interesting idea called mimetic theory out there, which you know, Peter Thiel and some other people in Silicon Valley are big fans of. Mimetic theory says it's all about human desire. Why do we want the things we want? Most of us see other people in the world that are models, they're role models, and we want the things that they want. So if Peter Thiel builds a $5 billion company, I think I want to do the same if he's my model, but I might not actually want to. 
you will generally get what you want in life. Okay. Now this may seem really weird. I think that you genuinely get what you want. However, most people don't know what they actually want. You may think you want the $5 billion company. Mm, maybe not. If you can do the work to truly understand what you want, that is more important than wealth. Doing what you want is more important than wealth, but you will acquire more wealth if you do what you want most of the time too. Certainly as entrepreneurs, there are so many different possibilities for us. And the key to wealth is a little indirect in my view. It's not going directly for the money that you see in front of you. It's not indulging in that short-term big paycheck unless it involves doing what you want. So what I would say is the key to wealth, but also as it turns out a fulfilled life is doing what you want. And if you do the work to understand what you actually want, as opposed to what you think you want, that's a rich, wealthy life in all respects. Yeah, well said. I, we talk a lot about, so that's a way to wealth podcast. And the podcast was designed around a process developed. I developed all the way back to 2002 and continue to refine and, and make better. And the process is really the design for fixing three things in our industry. One is there's way too much advice given without a thorough, clear understanding. So you hear 20% of the conversation and no matter what industry you're in, you're launching into your quiver of solving all these issues. And you've only heard the beginning of the conversation where the truth is like an iceberg. It's at the last 5%. The depth is what you don't see. And so creating a process where you can really get to the root issue is critically important. And then the solutions are easy. I mean, we all have the same options to work with out there. Um, most know about them. It's just what fits you best versus some fancy trust that may, and this with your world, that may make your life so freaking complicated that is the juice worth the squeeze? And candidly, most times, my experience has been it's not. They just are pulling it out because, oh, this is so fancy and it's going to fix. And then the person's trying to live with that going, oh my gosh, this is miserable. So it's because they didn't listen to get to the real root of who you are and what you're really trying to accomplish. They're just trying to knock off this, check this tax box. And I see it was, you know, a lot of planning with uh, tax planning, same kind of thing. Oh, let's, let's say, and are you really saving? So anyway, it's really back to time and space and getting real clear on your wants and goals and objectives and priorities for you, mm. not what someone else thinks they should be. Yeah. And I wish, I wish I had learned that. I mean, I, I heard it. It's one thing to hear it. I learned it from a young age. It's another thing to live it. It requires an immensely high level of integrity, right? Yeah. And I think if we can challenge ourselves to get there as entrepreneurs, we're not just going to be more, to build more profitable companies. We're going to contribute to the world in a much healthier way. That's what I'm signed up for, man, for sure. At this stage is yes, that's, that's, uh, that's the thousand business owners, like really having them focused on um, what this is really about. And, and you can do it in a way where nature is reciprocal. So actually, instead of showing up to extract, which yes. is not what nature does, is how can I give and show up to serve? And that actually makes me more profitable. So more of that infinity reciprocal type relationship that nature is here to teach us. So walking in it can help us remember that as well. What do you think are opportunities that are out there that may not be being viewed or um, uh, people may not be aware of? What do you see as opportunities now? I'm going to throw one big one and you can tell me if this is too general, Scott, but I think as entrepreneurs, many of us spend years growing a business organically. And what I mean by that is we pick an idea, we get some initial traction, we have some initial customers and we think to ourselves, I'm going to grow this business. The only way forward is to grow this business. And I want to offer a possible mindset shift to consider, which is whether it's a new business or maybe even a competition, maybe even a competitor with your current business, often one of the fastest ways to grow is through acquisition. And acquisition is not just for public companies. There's a myth that the only companies that can acquire other companies are big public companies or big funds. It's not true. Entrepreneurs with smaller companies, honestly, even if you don't have a business, you don't even, and you want to be an entrepreneur, you don't need to start one. You can acquire one. This is a little not that often discussed secret. 
And, you know, sometimes if you think about what you're lacking, if you don't have the right team in place, if you're, re- let's say you're at the very beginning of your entrepreneurial journey and you want to start a company and you're, you know, you're sitting in a job, you're a bit bored, but you don't have that best idea. You can acquire a company. I'm going to tell you another secret. You can sometimes do so for no money out of pocket. If you learn the art of negotiation, if you learn the art of understanding what a business owner wants, caring as much about their dream as yours, anything is negotiable and possible. So acquisitions are a tremendous shortcut to building wealth. And I think in the current climate, to answer your question even a bit more directly, with inflation being higher than is reported, and it's reported as pretty high, yeah. you want to build a portfolio that's going to serve you, you're going to need some higher returns than is the norm. And I can tell you that this is an asset class that actually is available to, I don't want to say the average, average person, but the average person that does a little bit of work, is willing to learn the craft a little bit and write me an email if you want to learn the basics. And I'm happy to help you understand that this is an asset class that can get you incredible returns. It can set you up for a life of freedom. And often in entrepreneurship, the hardest part is going from zero to one. It's getting an initial idea off the ground. I've run multiple companies. I can tell you it's the hardest thing. Most entrepreneurs who built multiple companies will tell you the same thing. You can shortcut that whole process. If you're a negotiator by nature, if you're creative, if you're a big picture thinker, acquisitions are a phenomenal opportunity potentially to do what you want and to generate plenty of wealth for your family. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. Uh, Dan Pena is right, someone who talks a lot about this, yeah. uh, like love him or hate him. He certainly uh, does know this space and saying, I agree with uh, that assessment that you're giving. And there's really four areas and there's more than four. But if you just think about it, uh, business is one of them. And, and what, what are the benefits? Well, you gave it. Like, leverage is one. You can literally do it without money out of your pocket. So you're using other people's money. You're using leverage. Real estate could be another That's another option to use other people's money, a potential way to keep up with inflation and uh, use leverage again there in real estate. Another could be commodities. You may like gold, silver, you may like art. You may like things, uh, coffee, who knows? I don't know what your your, your gig is, wine, but commodities. A fourth could be the market. Like, okay, you could still own companies, just publicly traded. My recommendation here is, and thank you, I think it's perfect advice. There's just an example of four different ones we're back to understanding who you are because the risk isn't in the investment. The risk is in the investor. Yes. So the, I didn't say the three things. I said the one thing that Way to Wealth was designed to solve. The first is getting to the real root, hearing the whole holistic picture, then advice can be given. Second is team. There's a lack of teamwork. There's way too many egos and silos in this industry, and that needs to be collective intelligence. Like there's power in collective. So the right team in place with not a bunch of egos surrounding you, because then you don't have to have all the answers. And third, education is lacking in our industry. So that's why Way to Wealth was designed. Clarity of the whole picture, teamwork, so you have a proper team in place, so you don't have all have to have all the a- answers, and then education about what your unique investor DNA is. It might be buying businesses, it might be buying real estate, it might be buying commodities. I gave several examples, and it might be investing in the market, and it might be a little bit of all, but really understanding so you're congruent. And I'll add one more piece to this because this is a piece I'm passionate about. So we talked about what can a thousand business owners do. Well, for me, it's about making the money clean, and you know this, and making the invisible visible. What's that mean? Well, the invisible visible is indigenous healing, which we're up to, and and I say we're we're up to, we're we're playing a small, teeny part of a big picture, and mental health, such a crisis globally, and that's also, these people just want to be seen, so making the invisible visible. Money clean, what am I talking about? There's so much, but one is just this. We support what we put our dollars to. So my experience has been when we get clear, let's say of what our unique, you know, it's business or real estate or commodities or the market. Let's just say it's the market. If people look at what they're actually invested in and compared that to their core values as a human or their core values as a business, most times they'd be shocked of what they're actually supporting. So that's a huge part of what I mean by making the money clean. Let's make sure, because we're voting with our dollars every day at the supermarket, 
at stores that you go to, and clearly what you invest your, your capital in, in the markets and others, you are voting with your dollars. Let's be clear and be congruent that what we're voting our dollars for or what our value system supports. So well said, and what a challenge to live in a high integrity way, because in the end, the highest possible integrity comes from knowing where your energy goes, where your money goes, right? And so, I mean, I, my why is ultimately to create for people financial freedom and mental freedom. Mm. And in the end, if your mental balance sheet has a whole bunch of stuff on it that are incongruent, it's going to be trouble. You're not going to be at peace. And that's what we all want anyway. I mean, why do people want tons of money? They think it'll get them peace at some level, right? 100%. So the definition of wealth, I learned this, I have him on the podcast at the end of this month, but I learned this from James Hughes, uh, actually an attorney that uh, has done a lot of work on creating legacies. And so the definition, he taught me a wealth going the whole way back to Latin is W-E-O, we all. So W-E-O-L. And the definition of W-E-O-L, we all, is well-being. So mm. the definition root of wealth is well-being. Spot on. That's what, we're, it, which could be described peace. That's what everyone's chasing. I've said many times, way to wealth. If I told you the way to wealth implemented within 12 months would make you a billionaire. Everyone would want to sign up for the way to wealth. And you're going to have unfulfilled relationships, no real purpose in life and questionable health. Do you still want the billion? Yeah. yeah. No. Right. So that's not really what we want. We want the sense of well-being. So yeah, man, um, lots of wisdom shared and dropped as usual. I really love how you think and what you're up to with um, your company and how you think about things and go about it certainly aligns. Uh, and, I, and I don't just like it because it aligns with me. I just think that it's the right thing as far as where we're headed and what's the good for all that you're mm. viewing it like that. It's back to that strategic and human aspect and tying those together. I think it's what we need right now. So I really love and support what you're doing with that, Dan. So any parting words that you would have that, uh, that would kind of, you would feel you would want to or need to share with the audience? Maybe just one last thought to wrap up, and that's as business owners, the easiest thing in the world is to cheer at what we're saying, to think, yeah, that sounds good, and then to not implement. And if there's one simple thing to implement, our conversation about the calendar, look at the calendar and ask yourself the question, is this what I really want? Be very honest with yourself. And if the answer is no, Understand what your why is and how you can be more congruent with it. Understand what you truly want, right? That's if there's one thing to take away, one thing to implement, it's that. Look at that calendar. It doesn't lie. And, you know, if you're not paying attention to it, you may be lying to yourself. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm glad you said that. That's so what's needed is you can hear it, but if you don't do anything with what we said, then it's really not much use. So that gives an actionable step. Speaking of actionable steps, mm. someone wants to learn more about you, maybe tools you've created and things that they, as you mentioned, like how to evaluate is business, buying a business right for you or how do you evaluate a business, et cetera. What's yeah. the best way to contact or reach out for any of that information? Sure. So if you go to firesidestrategic.com, you'll get to our website and you'll see there, there's buttons you can click on for our consulting and our private equity regardless of what you want. And there, there's also a contact page that you can use just to send a general email to us. If you're a listener of this podcast, feel free to write me an email at dan at firesidestrategic.com. You can go to the consulting page on firesidestrategic.com or the investing page, write us a note on there. Any of those are ways to get to me. And I just wish you the best on, if you're a listener of this podcast on your journey to wealth, freedom, mental and financial. Yeah. Thanks for being on, Dan. We'll have to do it again, but appreciate you sharing and taking the time to uh, share with the audience. So much appreciated. And with that, 
audience, you know, you can reach out to us anytime. The way to wealth.com is the easiest way. We actually have tools to help you navigate what is your investor DNA, what makes the most sense to you to create some time and space to get you there. So feel free to take us up on any questions that you have as far as that goes. And as usual, thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. And we'll catch you next week on the Way to Wealth podcast, where we're all about making money simple so you can fully live and you can fully live today. Later. The opinions voiced in Way to Wealth with Scott Ford, Managing Director, Partner, and Wealth Advisor of Carson Wealth, are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial, or tax advisor prior to investing. Guests on Way to Wealth are not affiliated with CWM LLC or Satara Advisor Networks LLC. Legato Family is not affiliated with Satara Advisor Networks LLC or CWM LLC. Carson Wealth, 19833, Leitersburg Pike, Suite 1, Hagerstown, Maryland, 21742.